Welcome to Playful Podcast, your guide into the underground scene where we discover topics on kink and electronic music every week. Don't forget to subscribe to not miss out on our next episode. We are happy to be here today with latex fetishist and comedian Terry Saunders. In this episode we speak about how he discovered his kinks, what sex parties has taught him, and he shares some funny stories from kinky events and much more. There will be some clicking noises, so for you who are only listening to this episode, it is Terry's latex suit. Anyhow, let's get it. I am Amanda, and this is Playful Podcast. Turns out she was at the same fetish club I was in, and it was her first time going. And she was like, oh, are you there too? And I was like, yeah. And then she was like, oh, so you're, you're really experienced then. And I'm like, oh, no, I mean, no, I'm, yeah, okay. And she said, oh, I had so many first time things happen tonight. She was like, I, you know, I was I had sex in a group. I did this, I did that, got spanked, all these things. And I was like, oh, great, good for you. You know, I'm trying to be kind of this magnanimous new me and then she said to me she said there's one thing I haven't done and I said what was that and she was like well I've never been fingered in a cab before <gasps> and I was like what <laughs> I was, and I just had this moment of going no this is this is a new me I'm not doing this kind of thing anymore and then like it was just this moment and then the, I made eye contact with the driver and the driver came gave me this look and I was just there thinking both of the people in this cab want me to finger this woman, and I don't think I want to. <laughs> oh my god, the pressure! And it was pressure. Oh and then my I ended god! Up, I, ended up, <laughs> I ended up doing it. And I'm like, oh, of course you did. <laughs> of course you did. And- Terry, we are so happy to have you in Playful Podcast. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for coming. And um, if we would start right off. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about your kinky self today? Sure. Well, now I'm a Berlin kinkster. And I, I wear latex whenever I can. I like to go kink clubbing. Um, yeah, and I guess I've just kind of started to develop a real community of kink friends here. And actually, this is now the most important thing. I think it used to be more about clubbing, and now it's more about having the world around you. Oh, I like a community. Did you meet through clubbing? Or? Mostly clubbing, yeah. So clubbing's still very important to me. But mm. um, yeah, I think for me it's about exploration and trust and intimacy with people. and Things that you can't necessarily get in club. You can meet those people in clubbing, but you can't necessarily get that stuff from clubbing. Do you feel it's different, the connections you create with other kinksters, compared to the connection you meet with, let's call it vanilla people? Oh, I think so, because I think you can get... I think there's a vulnerability that kinky people have, which is often quite hidden, but I think when you kind of get to know kinky people, there is this kind of, yeah, rawness, this kind of softness in the middle, and I think once you know someone's into this kind of thing, it's almost like you have this connection straight away, which is the same as if you have the same football team or something with someone else, but there's something deeper there, I think, yeah. What do you think that comes from? I think mostly we've all been on a journey to get somewhere, and I think especially to get through to a kinky community or a kinky world or just to be happy in your own kink, you've had to go through a lot of things, do a lot of work on yourself, you've had to understand yourself quite a lot. So I think when you meet other people that have been through the same journey, you kind of you have that in common Mm. and speaking of who were you then when you grew up or where did you grow up and who were you how was your upbringing so i grew up in a town called cheltenham which is like near bristol in the uk and my upbringing was fairly normal you know i i wasn't you know in any kind of crazy satanic cult or something it was a fairly normal growing up but um sexuality was an interesting one i mean i remember I remember being into shiny things from like a very young age. Like I remember being like nine or 10 and going through like the catalogs my mum would get and I'd be looking at the women in leather trousers or I'd be, I'd be whatever there was like sports clothes for school. I'd buy like the shiniest things and this kind of thing. So that it was always something there from a very young age. And people around you, they were not like, what are you wearing? There was a bit of that because I think a bit like now, where I now turn up <laughs> to, to things wearing latex, I would just be like the one kid in the shiniest things. And I do remember, I don't remember much being sexual, but I do remember once kind of 
writhing around on the floor wearing these shiny shorts, watching telly or something. And my cousin saying to my mum, what is he doing? And I remember this like memory is just like seared into my memory of just like, that was wrong. Hide, hide this. <laughs> oh, yeah. But what, well, when did you then discover it was a kink or how did the whole finding the next step look like? Yeah, I guess. Well, two things. It was, I, I came out as gay when I was about 16 or 17 years old. I went to college, met a gay guy, fell in love, came out, thought I was gay, went to a club, saw some people in like shiny clothes. And I was like, this is what gay's being like. And then a few months later, kind of realized that I still had a fancied woman. And I was like, this is confusing. I'm gay. I can't, I can't. I can't go back. You know, I had to go back in a bit after coming out and just be like, I think I'm bi. But um, so it was partly that, and it was partly being shown this world of clubbing and like people in PVC trousers and you know all this kind of thing. And then when the internet came around, it was just this you know light bulb moment of like looking you know looking at like porn searches or something, and then discovering you know because I used to love PVC and leather and satin and that kind of thing. And then like the internet told me there was this thing called latex. And I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and then suddenly, you know, back on old dial up internet, waiting for the picture to come <laughs> line by line, I'm getting these like latex pictures. Like, wow, it's just amazing. And then, but then you had yeah. never worn it. You could just no. imagine the feeling of it. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no um, shop in my hometown that sold it. There was no where I could look at it. No one I knew had any, you know, it was kind of, this magic thing. So I then, when I was about 21, I moved to London. And then there were like big clubs in London that I knew about. But even then it took me years to kind of build up the courage to go. And then I went to a fetish club when I was about 25, I think. And 25, was that your first? That uh, was the first fetish club. I went to Torchy Garden. And then you London. lived in London since five years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, I think I was always just too scared. I heard about it, I was too scared. I was like, didn't know what to do, didn't know anyone to go with, all this kind of stuff. Oh yeah, please yes. tell me about the first time because I think also this is something like people can feel very insecure, mm. especially in some clubs where people are very, you know, used to the scene and are, you know, they totally. have found their kinks and their gear and everything is like next Ab level. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I first went on my own to a club because I didn't ever find Very anyone brave. to go. What This is the thing. It feels brave now. At the mm -hmm. time, it was just like I didn't have a choice. No one, I, all my friends didn't want to go. You know, I didn't know anybody that was into that world. I mean, again, the internet was a little less mature. This was about 2005. So there was slightly less kind of groups and meetings and dating and everything. It was like, it was a bit harder to find someone. Not impossible, but harder. Mm. And so I just packed up the courage, went on my own. I bought a terrible... My first latex outfit was this terrible, terrible top from eBay that was like this nasty, cheap, molded rubber that didn't fit. It was full of creases and everything. And I wore that and a pair of PVC trousers and went to this club. And I remember vividly walking through the door and seeing everyone wearing latex. And I was there going, this is like heaven. I don't know. I've never done anything like this. And it was just, I could barely move. And then, you know, get talking to people and had a fun night you know made some friends that night it wasn't the most life-changing best night in my life but at the same time it was like a very important kind of I can do this and then I made some friends and then started going more often and going with these friends and then getting to know people and just opening this world yeah okay and what does that mean also opening this world like what did you find out about your latex kink well i suppose the first thing was like anything that you've i suppose if anyone's got an obsession that's just theirs and they don't share it with anybody whether that's a sexy kinky one or whether it's making model aircraft or whatever if, if you don't have anyone to share it with it feels like you're a bit weird or a bit of a freak and everything and obviously with latex it's such a freak you know freaky thing and everything and then when you get to know people and then they can tell you the best kind of shiner to use or the best way to get latex on or oh, don't buy stuff from there, buy stuff from here. And suddenly you feel, like I said, again, the community aspect, you feel like you're mm. part of something. Mm. And and even then, just to be with people that find latex sexy was always a surprise to me because I was so used to being the only one. Like I remember going like to like regular like vanilla clubbing before and I'd often wear like PVC trousers or something because I used to like them. And then... 
if you see, if I saw like a, say a woman in PVC trousers, I'd have this kind of presumption that oh, you must find PVC as sexy as I do. Therefore, you must find me sexy. And it's just this thing where the other people would be like, no, they're just fashionable. You're free. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. yeah. No one shares this. But when you're in a fetish club, actually people go, yeah, I do find this sexy. You're like, okay, good. I like this. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's a different space. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But uh, when you entered in your beautiful Terry latex dress suit, <laughs> I was like, where? It's personalized. Where did you get it from? Okay. So there is a story behind this suit. So, so for a while... I, after going after going clubbing for a few years, I stopped clubbing for a while. I was married for a while in London, and we to a woman or a man to a woman to a woman. To this a woman. Yeah. Okay. And then after after that ended, um, I started going out again, and I didn't. I, for some reason, I felt uncomfortable using my name, and I was I wanted to be someone different. It was a very strange time, so I chose this name at random, called myself Alfie. And then I had a bunch of new friends that I'd met in this new kind of second era of clubbing that all knew me as Alfie. And then I was doing therapy a couple of years later. I was trying to kind of sort things out. Like things weren't going particularly well. I was relying on clubbing a bit too much. And my therapist was like, you should try and bring these two halves of yourself together. You know, you've got your Terry life, you've got your Alfie life, and you've got them very separate. And maybe you should try and bring them together. So I had this night out where I told all my clubbing friends, my name's really Terry. And they were like, and everyone was fine about it. And a few of them were like, well, yeah, the name you know me by isn't really my name anyway. And I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. And then the next day, and this is, I swear, completely true. The next day, me and my friend were hungover. And there was a shop in London called Libidex, which is a really good latex brand. And they have like a, a sample sale shop that was on. So we go there because we're, we're nearby. We go, we pop in. And my friend's looking at all the latex stuff downstairs. And I go upstairs and there's all these cat suits. And I'm flicking through the cat suits, and I find this one with Terry written on it. The day after I told my friends my name was Terry, <laughs> and I was like, "No way!" And then I was like, "There's no." And I look, I look through the thing. There's no other. Cat it's suit. yours. It's your size. Yeah, yeah. And then I try it on my perfect size, and that's so weird. There's no other cat suits with names on. It's not like there's. It's not like you know the the rulers at Bauhaus where you got all those kind of different things. It's like no, this is just one with Terry on, <laughs> and. I go to the woman at the till and I'm just like, why Why have you got this? And she was just like, um, we just had to show that we could put a name on a cat suit. So we chose Terry. And I was like, but Terry's my name. And I kind of told her this whole thing. And I told her the story really quickly. And she was like, okay, great. And then she kind of charged me for it. And it was like a hundred pounds because no one wants a cat suit with Terry on. Normally these things are like three, four, five hundred. It was like a hundred because it's so unique. Wow. And I bought it and now I have it. <laughs> So, is it your favorite one? It is my favorite. It's just a bit weird to wear, like because like when you saw it, you were just like, "You got it custom made." Because it's this—the idea is I've got a custom made thing with my name on. Whereas actually, my personality, I would never have a custom thing with my name on. <laughs> but I found it, so I have to have it. So, so but yeah. It's funny though, because for example, I told you earlier about the the podcast we did with the two puppies, mm, yeah, yeah. and they were having like Marlon and Leo, like necklaces just like dogs do mm. i mean it's a complete different uh, fetish however we're on the same parties yeah exactly. <laughs> so i mean it's funny though no, that it's exactly. different you're like no <laughs> yeah I wouldn't but here you are but though here I, am. I go out with it i mean the worst time i've had is there was once when i um i had like a grinder meet with a guy who was into rubber he came over i put this on because it was anything i had out and then we had some kind of not great sex, and he left quite quickly. And I realized I didn't tell him the story. So I was just there going, oh, God, there's this guy walking around Berlin with this story going, I had sex with this guy who had a cat suit with his name on, weirdo. <laughs> but hopefully it's okay. <laughs> oh, I think it's funny, though, how you always think everything through so many times yourself yeah, but yeah, i yeah. guess he doesn't i hope like <laughs> i would i would just i just th thought it was really cool that you but have your you name that's the thing maybe it's cool it maybe is very it cool is. yeah I've never it that way. it's just cool it is very cool yeah but like um i just did you uh, feel comfortable playing at these clubs directly or how did you ease into that yeah, well, my thing, so at first, my thing was not into any other kind of kink or play apart from latex. It was like dressing up, you know, kissing people, having sex, whatever, but it wasn't about any other kink. And I remember going into uh, the dungeon at one of these clubs in London, 
and seeing people getting spanked and everything. And the first time I saw it, I was like, well, this is silly. I don't want, this is stupid. I'm not involved in, interested in this. And then next time I went in, I'm like, I'm just going to go and check on that silly thing that I don't like again. You know? And then just like, that I really don't like. I really don't like I'm it. Not I'm not intrigued just, by it yeah, at all. <laughs> at all. I'm just going to go and just check. I'm not intrigued, you know? And then this would keep happening. And I was, I never had the bravery to like play or do anything. And then I had this crazy thing where I was, it was back when I was doing stand up comedy in the UK and I was doing a, a gig somewhere and I'd got to this town really early and I'm in this pub in the afternoon, got hours to kill. So I'm just like reading a book, minding my own business. And in this pub there's this like birthday party that's like a big gang of lads that are having this kind of birthday party and it's all like raucous and everything. And every time someone buys someone a drink, they slap this birthday boy on the back. They like lift his shirt up and slap him on the back. And I'm just there like reading this book and I'm hearing this very familiar noise of <laughs> palms on the skin. And I'm just there going... I'm really aroused. I'm <laughs> just like, I think I'm into this. And then the next time I go clubbing, I then get into, you know, I then go to the dungeon and I talk to someone, I get involved. And then that again opens up a whole other world because then you realize there's all these other things you don't know about. And then you get to meet people and you know, that. And yeah, so that was another big moment for sure. Wow. You also mentioned your uh, comedy. Mm, yes. Which is, I find very interesting because it's, we, we touched on it before a little bit, before the interview started, that, you know, being a kinkster is not accepted and mm -hmm. like somewhat what Playful does is bringing like the mainstream together with the underground and the kink scene just to like also normalize yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Um, why, can you tell us a little bit about your, like adding humor to it and what it brings you and how did you even got into that yeah well I did so I did comedy professionally in London for like 10 years about about 10 years ago so I was doing comedy you know as a full-time job and I would rarely if ever mention kink it was like it's a big part of my life but I would never talk about it on stage I would never do material about kink it was always like it was a bit like this kind of shame of having these two sides of my life the, the Terry and the Alfie, if you like, it was like, well, Terry doesn't talk about King, you know, this isn't my thing. And I've since started getting back into comedy back here in Berlin, and I'm running this Time to Shine night, which is all about kink and comedy. And it's because really, when you think about it, kink is pretty silly, I think. I think it's pretty funny. Like, you can take it very seriously. It's very playful. It's, but it can be very playful. Yeah. It's a perfect word for it, isn't it? And it's just this idea of so many silly things can happen. And I have so many stories over the years of just... Well, things like buying a cat suit with my name on and stuff like that. It's just that there are so many things that have come up. And this, when I got back into doing comedy, I was just like, well, why don't I actually now, now that I feel much freer to talk about this stuff, why don't I just talk about this? And then, so we've set up this night where we have, and people come all dressed in latex and all the comedians that are on talk about kink and everything. And it's just, it's trying to kind of take it away from being just like a comedy night with a theme to actually, again, being this community and being sharing stories about these things because actually kink and I suppose like you're saying we're doing this podcast and everything it's like actually to hear these stories from other people and to to find out these things are okay or to, to tell a story about where something went wrong in a dark room or something actually kind of normalizes it and just says it's okay it doesn't have to be this perfect thing that every time you go out you have to have the best night of your life it can actually be there's lots of mistakes on the way and there's funny things and it's it's okay to laugh about it yeah. do you have any now I'm taking you off guard but do you have any funny stories that you are your favorites or like one there's there is one actually I guess about that I tell on stage which is about a um a time in a couple's room which is uh in like a kind of the sex room in a club in London and I go in there with someone I just met and you know we're trying to enjoy ourselves but I used to be very I don't know what the word would be. I used to be very kind of highly strung about everything being perfect. It's like, you know, we, we'd, we'd start doing something in the room, but like no one was looking at us. And I'm like, well, if we're not doing it, then, you know, if, if you're doing something without being looked at, did it really happen kind of thing? So when we're trying to kind of maneuver to people watching or whatever, and then get near this other couple, and there's this guy, this big kind of alpha guy or whatever, and he's, we kind of make eye contact, and I realize that something's going to happen. I'm not sure. And then... 
this guy kind of takes the girl that I'm with and they start to do something, the three of them. And I'm like, well, I'm watching them going, well, this is hot. And then after a while, I realized that I've been totally pushed away from the scene. <laughs> and I was like, this is fine. And I try to kind of get myself back involved. And the guy's like, yeah, fuck off. And I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? And then I realized, and, and also this was in a club torture garden where they have these rules if you've got to you've got to leave with the person you came in with no. and so I try to leave and they won't let me leave so I'm in this sex room on my own like against my will <laughs> <laughs> and yeah and then just had to wait for them to finish and then I kind of left and it was just like this like at the time horrible moment and then the next morning kind of wake up and go that is quite funny and then I start telling the story to friends oh and it's funny God. so yeah but again these things can be really horrible but actually you know, it, it, they're it, so it, wild and yeah. that's so crazy. Also, that that he was such an alpha dude. You know, yeah. the whole it paints the story about you know these. It's interesting, like all these. Um, what do you call them? Like um, hierarchy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are definitely appropriable. In all rooms. No, exactly. They can be, at least. Exactly. And it's just oh not being God. aware of the situation you're getting into. Yeah. And then suddenly you're oh, like, what the hell did this happen? What happened then? You left with her. Left with her. And but then we like, kind of... Why did you have fun? And she was like, oh, that was great. Where did you go? And I was just then pretended, oh, I was having fun somewhere <laughs> else. You know, I was doing something with someone. It was... Oh, it was great. I had great fun too. Anyway, nice to meet you. Bye. <laughs> I had such a wild night. Oh, it was you wouldn't crazy. understand. Yeah. It was great. It was amazing. I should have been there. Oh, it would have been great, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I want to hear another one. Do you have one last one? So there is another one I tell. Okay, I'm, I'm, you're selling I'm this. Doing... I need to come to your oh, comedy well, there you go. This like, is good. But okay, one more and then I'm going to come next time. We have now come to the part of the podcast where if you are or want to become a Patreon and support the work that we do, as well as get more juicy material, go to patreon.com slash playful magazine. And in this extra material, we're speaking about kinks and how one can find out what kinks one is intrigued by and maybe even find a new fetish. Go to patreon.com slash playful magazine. Great. Well, there's another one that um, I'll tell a very short version of it because it's a bit long, but I'd, I'd been to this club and I decided to... Oh, look how much it's dripping. Oh, don't worry. Let it drip. Let it drip. <laughs> <laughs> this is how exciting my stories are. I'm just dripping. No, I'd been to this club and I decided it was time for me to stop going clubbing and I'd had this kind of moment of like... When was it? This was again about maybe five, four or five years ago. And it was just like, I'm done. I'm going out too much, all this stuff. And it was like an epiphany. I'm like, well, I'm never going to go out again. And I, you know, I was over the top. And if any of my friends had been there that night, they'd have been like, oh, you're never going again. Don't you always say this? Because I've always got to go to this moment. And I'm getting a taxi home and I'm waiting for the taxi. And there's this woman in the street and she looks really upset. So I'm just like, oh, are you okay? And she's like, oh, my phone's dead. I haven't got any battery. I can't get home. And I was like, oh, where do you live? And she's like, near me. So I was just like, look, I can, can get in my cab. I promise I'm not being weird or creepy. Like, seriously, you can just get in. And we get in the cab and we're talking. And I say, how's your night been? And she's like, oh, I was at this club. It was amazing. And I was like, oh, really? What was it? And it turns out she was at the same fetish club I was in. And it was her first time going. And she was like, oh, were you there too? And I was like, yeah. And then... I kind of said, well, I'm not going to go anywhere because I've stopped. And she's like, oh. You what? You said I, what? I was like, oh, I said, it's probably my last time going. You know, oh, I'm not yeah. going to do this anymore. And she was like, oh, so you're, you're really experienced then. And I'm like, oh, no, I mean, no. I'm, yeah, okay. And she said, oh, I had so many first time things happen tonight. She was like, I, you know, I was had sex in a group. I did this, I did that, got spanked, all these things. And I was like, oh, great, good for you. You know, I'm trying to be kind of this magnanimous new me. And then she said to me, she said, there's one thing I haven't done. And I said, what was that? And she was like, well, I've never been fingered in a cab before. <gasps> and I was like, what? <laughs> I was, and I just had this moment of going, no, this is, this is a new me. I'm not doing this kind of thing anymore. And then like, it was just this moment. And then the, I made eye contact with the driver and the driver came and gave me this look. And I was just there thinking, both of the people in this cab want me to finger this woman. And I don't think I want to. <laughs> Oh my god, the pressure! And it was pressure. Oh and then my I ended god! Up, I, ended up, I ended up doing it. And I'm like, oh, of course you did. That? Of course you did. And yeah, and um, oh my god, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I don't know if this is like 
traumatizing for you but i guess since you tell it it's no not. it's funny that's okay, the thing the, the <laughs> next day you kind of wake up and you tell someone a story and then they laugh and you're like oh no it's funny isn't it that is a funny story but yeah so there's all these kind of things oh uh, my yeah. god was well, she, she was like oh my god so many new things fulfilled when she got back yeah even she, like she, ending the night <laughs> yeah she's like then i met this guy in a cat suit in a taxi and i was like hi <laughs> he had his name on it i think he was terry <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh that is so funny okay but you have mentioned you have touched on a few times i think that you wanted to get out of the scene or you want to stop partying or clubbing or Mm -hmm. what is this about i think for a long time i was using clubbing and drug taking as well to be honest as a kind of escape more than a place to be and i think i was using it quite unhealthily and i was obsessing about the next night and everything became about the next night out and like the rest of my life would like focus on this Mm. which can be fine for some people but for me it got a bit much and I had to take quite a break from it but now I'm kind of back in what I hope is a much more kind of healthy way of doing things for enjoyment and not just for this like compulsive need which I think I think there's always this idea of the next night will be the perfect one I was always annoyed if a night wasn't perfect and then would wait then tell myself the next one's going to be perfect or the next one and of course no night is ever perfect you know so it's always this kind of step to disappointment or this step to always be the next thing so you know it took I think a while of therapy and all this kind of stuff to kind of realize that I really enjoy clubbing but I've got to kind of take the importance away from it a bit yeah yeah so did you how often did you club then when you were hunting the next high or, oh you know? god it could be every week you know every, you know twice a week it could just be every time there's something on and of course living in london or berlin there's always something on there's always a night you can miss you know exactly i was like every weekend yeah that's for the most people here super normal exactly and mm. then you know and then you can be like twice a weekend or three times a weekend or mm. be like there's something on wednesday and then there's something on thursday and i'm going out friday it's just this thing and then we end up in Bergen on sunday and we'd be there till monday and then it's just like oh god this is too much mm. but but for me i think it was a lot more about just trying to get the rest of my life in a good place to then enjoy the decadence kind of thing i think if the decadence becomes everything yeah that's the kind of worry isn't it mm. What are some things that you have discovered as like indulging in the kink scene about yourself or about the environment you're in or the world or whatever? Yeah, I suppose I was always someone, I mean, this might seem quite weird being a comedian, but I'm someone who's actually quite shy most of the time. So actually to take, to go to a club and to find these partners for like intimate play or to you know connect with people it's really makes you feel something good about yourself it gives you some confidence i think and actually going to this world and meeting these people gave me a different kind of confidence in life i think so yeah that really helped yeah and what you said you said also that it's a very nice like it's a very kind community yeah 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 I think, like any community, there's all sorts, but I think there's a lot of places, like Club of Oakland, for example, in London and there in Berlin, they they foster this, these great people who work there and play there, and it becomes almost like a kind of social space to hang out in, and then I've got a bunch of friends from that world, and we'll go to other things, and festivals, and nights out, and cinema, or whatever, and you just kind of, you realise you've got normal, real-world friends that you've got from this what was once for me a very hidden world and now it's very much part of my life yeah exactly yeah that's that's what they're creating here also i'm so excited to see i've never been to their parties in london okay so i'm very excited to see because we had drinks with them last week nice. and we were talking a little bit about like their yeah, the journey in Berlin and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm so excited to see all this. Like, they have such a determined focus oh, and, like, sure. picture of what they're creating. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. very impressed by that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That, their vision of everything they're doing has always been very strong. And, yeah, nothing but admiration for what they do. Yeah, same. Yeah. But, um, so you are very you know the london scene very well Mm -hmm. and also the berlin scene now since three years back very Mm -hmm. well if we would compare the two cities and their 
kink scenes. How could we, how could you describe the two? How do they differ and what similarities do they have too? Yeah, I think there is actually quite a bit more difference than I'd have expected before coming here because, you know, I used to come clubbing here as a kind of visitor and would think it was like broadly the same. But actually, and I hate to admit this, living here in Berlin, but like Berlin was always like, I was always thought I'm going to move to the kinkiest city. I'm going to move to Berlin. It's so kinky. It's so amazing. Uh -uh. It's definitely, well, the thing is, it's definitely a kinky city. There's a lot of people kinky here. And the difference I think in London is you've got your kink clubs, which is where all the kinky people go. And you've got like the vanilla clubs to one of a better word. Whereas in Berlin, it tends to be everywhere's a bit kinky. You know, most clubs, well, there'll be somebody in some kind of rubber outfit or something or a burkhard or whatever. But the actual kind of kinky parties in Berlin are a little bit lacking, I think. I actually think they've not been as good as the ones in London. I think the culture here is very much more take some drugs, go to an after party, you dance at the party, but there's no kind of play at parties here. There's no really any places with like dungeon space or anything, that kind of thing. If there are, they're not really used. And consent has been something that's been quite eye-openingly different here. Okay, tell me about it. Well, I just think in London, and again, with K KV have been the people that I think KV really... KV being you know, for both yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. And they've really, I think, changed the game in London in the last seven years or so they've been going. You know, and they, they have their teams and the, the people doing the awareness and the safety and everything. And I think... Here in Berlin, there's definitely more of this kind of idea of just grabbing someone's ass in Kit Kat or something is totally fine to a lot of people. And the clubs themselves don't necessarily do anything or they say, oh, it's fine. You're in a sex club. What do you expect? And actually, I think the views are changing. And I think London has become a very different place for this. And actually, it's much more about consent. And I think, you know, it's, I'm not saying it's not here at all, but I do think Berlin is a little bit behind on that. And But I think it's catching up slowly. Thank you so, so much for coming here. We're so You're happy to have you. So happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. That was a lovely talk. All right, extra material. Philip. This was it for Playful Podcast this week. But please follow, subscribe and listen to our next episode. And if you want to have a say about future artists or even ask your own question to one of our guests, follow us on Instagram and make sure to add your question when we lift our coming guests. Thank you so much for joining and see you next week.